Thank God for mercy. Amen. I'm telling you what's in all the sinners in this room, just to think what would have happened to us if God uh, dealt us justice. Thank God he had mercy on every one of us. You know what mercy does? It's so important that we contemplate that in Scripture and in song because it knocks the starch out of us. Sometimes we get too proud, we get too used to things, we take so much for granted, and we forget this whole thing is about God's mercy. Amen? Thank the Lord for His wonderful grace. Take the Word of God this uh, morning, if you will, open to Ephesians 5. Ephesians is such an important book and such an important study um, as we take in these uh, fresh doctrines that were written to a young church in the midst of a uh, completely uh, pagan society, godless, uh, idolistic society. Um, but I'm about to read to you uh, this morning probably the most important verse in, in all of the book for believers. Tonight we did, today we deal with the central verses of where we left off last week, verse 18 through 21. So if you will, follow with me, Ephesians 5, verse 18 through 21. Paul writes and says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, that is, wherein leads you to godless lifestyle and choices, godless. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. May the Holy Spirit Himself bless and teach us the reading of His Word. I want to share with you from this text simply, L-U-I, living under the influence of the Spirit. My friend, before you ever get to these pages, before you ever get to the fifth chapter, we've already walked through the first and the second chapter. A chapter that tells the man the most important information he ever need to know, that you are lost without God. You are sinful by, your, by birth as well as by choice. And God had mercy on you and He sent the answer for your sin and your death. And it was the death of His own Son. The Savior came, God's Son, clothed in flesh, born as a man with the express purpose as a man to die for men to be raised again the third day so that people can be reconciled to God, so that nothing can keep us from God except for our own pride and continued rebellion. God opened the door. He built the bridge for men and women to repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ and be saved eternally. The most important message of all the Word of God points to who Jesus is and what did He do. He died on the cross for our sins and He rose again the third day. The most important principles of the Word of God, in particular, the one most focused on in the New Testament. But after Calvary and the empty tomb, the single most important message of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit's work and presence in a believer. Yet this important Christian privilege is neglected in understanding and cooperation. A lack of understanding of the purpose and the role of the Holy Spirit from a biblical perspective has given rise to all kinds of false teachings. The Spirit has falsely been blamed for all type of emotional experiences, fleshly impulses, out-of-control actions, mysterious voices, and absurd utterances. This confusion of the Holy Spirit robs God's people of the thing we need the most and He provides the best. Power. Real power. God's power to our lives. Acts 1, 8, 7, and 8, you remember the, the uh, disciples were asking a, 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 a apocalyptic uh, question. They were asking a prophetic question. Jesus says that that's not on the plate right now. You don't need more just education. What you need is more power. So right now, go back to Jerusalem and you wait until God gives you power by the Holy Spirit of God. 
Now look around the church. Yes, there's a lot of ignorance and confusion, but we got more information. We got more access to study than any other time. The one thing church lacks now is power, and we can only surmise that that's because, my friend, we've got all the information and all the techniques. We've lost our walking and feeling with the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God is in essence come to give God's people power. It can be summarized in that. As the Comforter, Jesus said in John 15, He brings soul power. As the peace of God in our life, He brings emotional power. As the guide of our life, He brings mental and discerning power. As the gifter of God's people, He brings ministry power. As the fruit bearer in our lives, He brings moral power. As the reprover of the world, He brings witnessing power. As the advocate for the believer, He brings praying power. He gives power to live, power to love, power to endure, and power to sense God and to serve Him until we see Him. It is this feeling of the Holy Spirit of God that He's calling us to stay tapped into, to continually, obediently make sure that we are filled with the Spirit. Question is, what does it mean to be filled? What are the indications that we are filled? And ultimately, how does a believer walk every day and maintain this filling of the Spirit? Well, hopefully I want to answer these questions through these four verses that we've looked at this morning. You, you see, the great demands that have already been given in this chapter, we, we've already, God commanded us to walk in love. What kind of love? God's love, the same love He loved us. Did you ever try that one? He's called us to walk in light. God is light, He's sinless, uh, and He's in our life, and now He's holy, and we're to walk as holy. How's that working now? He calls us to walk in wisdom and to learn and to be discerning about our lives and making right choices. Verse 17, he called us right before this verse. He says, understand what God's will is. So to walk in God's perfect will, learn that and walk in it. And and those are tremendous demands. It doesn't get any easier because right after these short four verses, he enters into the closing of the whole book where he will go through place by place, position by position. He will tell husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. He will tell wives to submit themselves in everything and in every way to your husband. He will tell parents, be careful and wise and train your children up without all the wrath involved. He tells children to be obedient to their parents. He tells employers how to be in good employers of their people and employees how to be good workers and obedient and submissive to your employers. He goes and gets in all of our business and all of our mail with great demands on our life. All those demands, when you read them, if it were not for these four verses, we would be overwhelmed at the task being demanded of us. We feel like that cloud without any water to give. We feel like a plant that's withering away with no power to produce the fruit. And so when God speaks here in these four verses, I'm telling you, what He gives you is the motor of Christianity. He gives you the power plant, my friend, to not only think about and aspire to do the things God has called us, but to do them well. Not in your own strength, because you do not have the ability to meet all these demands. And so God says, you need me. You need me to fulfill the commands that I've put upon your life. You need me indwelling you, empowering you in every single aspect of life. And it's here that He has called us to be filled. Now note, to begin with, when, you, when we talk about feelings, we're not talking about being baptized by the Spirit. We've already dealt with that in chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. That the Spirit of God, the moment you're saved, the moment you believe God does something for you, He he, he baptizes you into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. This is not talking about the indwelling of the Spirit of God because the moment you trust Christ, God comes to live in by His Spirit. And Jesus says when He comes in, He's staying there forever. You can't get rid of Him. He owns your body now, right? You've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own. The Spirit of God lives in you. So the feeling it having to do with this baptism of salvation and indwelling of salvation that God does, now He's telling us how to walk with the Spirit. He's talking about making sure that we are dependent upon Him. We are conscious of Him as He wants to live out His life in us, that we are cooperating with Him, being filled with the Spirit. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. I've heard somebody say, 
uh, a long time ago as a young Christian. I've, I've watched people come to Christ and so forth, and it doesn't take too long. You'll see people come in the church, maybe even get baptized, and then they shortly fizzle out. And sometimes I've heard people say, well, I didn't what I was expecting. I thought if you got saved, you're always going to be happy and you'd have all your need. Everything was going to be uh, provided, wonderful. You're going to take off with all this prosperity in every way. And I didn't know that we were ever going to be tempted anymore. And I want to tell you what, my friend, all that is false teaching. That's why you need the Holy Spirit of God, because it's going to get difficult. Life's tough. Being a Christian is impossible without the presence of the Spirit of God in our life. So these believers, we learn to, to, to come along and learn to be filled with the Spirit. He's in us. He's not going anywhere. But there's this sense where the Scripture is commanding us to make sure we're staying in tune with Him and full and dependent upon His power. By the way, it's pretty remarkable because point number one is how He compares this living under the influence. Verse 18, right? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess or that leads to ungodly behavior, but be filled with the Spirit. So watch, sometimes the Scripture teaches us some things by comparison. Sometimes it teaches us some things by contrast. And so here he comes along and he says, it's kind of like, let me, let me make this symbol for you. Everybody knows what it is to see somebody or maybe know somebody or maybe all your context comes from watching uh, episodes of Andy Griffith where, where you got Otis, right? Everybody knows what it is to see somebody drunk. They know the impairments. They've heard somewhere along the line, we've heard of DUIs, right? Where somewhere along the line you're held accountable by the law because when you're intoxicated, you're not driving like you would normally drive. Right? And so there's something else influencing your life to make you drive in a way that you would not normally drive. And so while the scripture gives all manner of warnings and commands against alcohol, in fact, my friend, listen, I just call you to salvation. I call you to some personal wisdom and some maturity in Christ to realize if alcohol is the number one killer in this country, why in the world would you open the crack of the door for it to enter into your life or into your marriage or into your children or into my children by your use of that, my friend? Somewhere along the line, people got to quit worrying about what I get away with and start realizing, what can I do to honor God with my life? And so it says, be not drunk with wine. But the expression here is not just to say as much of the Scripture has warned against alcohol. It's saying, don't do this, which leads, obviously, to this ungodly behavior. But by comparison, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, you, need, you don't need that influence, but you do need some influence. You need God's influence. This is the teaching, the power of God in your life. He's saying what you need is, is His power in your life to do the same thing that alcohol does. See, alcohol will lead you to speak and act and behave in ways you would not normally. So when a man's full of the Spirit of God, he will do and act and think and have an attitude different from what he normally does. Right. For people say, well, that's just not who I am. I, I, I'm just not much of a talker. I'm not, I'm not a much of a people person. It don't matter what you are. It matter what God wants you to be and He's enabling you to do. And so when you say, well, I just can't forgive, what you're saying is, my friend, God put His Spirit in you for nothing. Because He gave you His Spirit for those very impossible things. Things people don't normally do. Christians can do them. Not because of our, our willpower. Not because of our self-determination. But my friend, tapping into the third person that God had. I'll remind you, when Genesis 1 opens up, it says, And the world was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's what you saw, empty, dark. When the Holy Spirit of God got done with it, the chaos came, became creation. And that's what God, through His Holy Spirit, does in our own life. So the word, be filled, is important to define. The word field means it's used in Greek uh, as a term to mean to fill a sail to carry a ship. Literally, the word means to cram. You ever crammed anything? How many of y'all like uh, somewhere along the line in my household, there's always those certain drawers, <laughs> right? Dresser drawers. I was watching somebody, I won't name their name. I saw them the other day and they were closing this drawer and mashing and closing. I was like, what in the world? Something that needs to come out, right? We ain't getting bigger drawers. And so 
means to cram. And so it's not that I come along and I need more of the Spirit of God. It's that I, God's Spirit, I need to let Him have more of me and to, to take all that He has available for me. And I want to be consumed with Him. I don't want to be tipping my toe in the waters of Christianity. I want to be diving into the depths and saying, God, w- without you, I cannot do this. It means to control. That's the emphasis in the New Testament when you find this word used many times, not always for positive things. In fact, you'll follow many passages. John 16, 6, it says, and they were filled with sorrow. It meant their sorrow was controlling them. John 16, 6, they were filled with fear. It it, it, it controlled their their bodily responses and their attitudes because they were filled or controlled by fear. John 16, 11, they they were filled with madness. The Bible that describes uh, the, the aggravation and the willingness of these enemies of Christ to go after Him. They did these unthinkable things because they were controlled by their madness. Romans 1, filled with sin. Acts 13, 45, they were filled with envy. Acts 19, 2, they were filled with confusion. In all of these negative ways, the feeling means they were so full of this that it drove them to action. It controlled them. You ever had your anger take control of you? You ever had jealousies take control? You ever had sorrows dominate and take control of your life and lead you into depression? That's what the word feel means. And so it's described here in these negative ways. But then Acts 16, 5, it said about Stephen, he was full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he had all this reputation of godliness. And he could tell he was filled with the Spirit of God. And so when you begin to read this passage, you read in verse 1 of chapter 5, he's called us to love in extraordinary ways. And then verse number 9, he says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. In other words, I want you to love hard. I want you to love like God does. But here's the only way you're going to get it done. The power of the Spirit of God to bring forth those fruits in your life. And so to be filled is to do the unnatural. right? That's why Paul could write in Philippians, I can do all things through what? Christ who does what? Strengthens me. And what was he talking about? The presence of the Spirit of God to strengthen him to deal with whatever he had to deal with in life. To control him. So as a drunk is under the influence of alcohol. By the way, you you get a man drunk, take a timid man, get him drunk, and you'll make him a brawl. Or take a brawling man, get him drunk, and many times you'll just make him him, uh, more more somber, right? More laid back. And sometimes you you take a guy and you get him drunk and it, it, it just exasperates what he typically is. When we see that, we know there's something else influencing their life. And so, my friends, the Spirit of God enables us to do what we would not normally do. Please hear that as I've intentionally repeated it. The Spirit of God enables a man to do what he would not normally do or a woman to do what she would not normally do. Right? So God's called us to bear witness to the world, right? To go out and share with, in uncomfortable conversations with family and friends and neighbors we don't know and people that we meet, perfect strangers. He's called us to do that in, in our time, our voice, our dollars. And so we say, well, I, I'm just, I can't do that like y'all can. I'm just not like that. Well, well, see, the moment you say that, all you're doing is recognizing and confessing the reason you need the Spirit of God. Because see, He's going to enable you. In fact, that's Acts 1.8. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you shall be witnesses. It, it's, it's, that's the flow. You shall be witnesses after the Holy Ghost of God gives you power. Again, in all these matter of things, whether it's forgiveness, my friend, I want to tell you what, to move from a despising and a hatred of a parent uh, and, and all of a sudden God comes along with His grace and gives you every reason to forgive, but then power to go and show that mercy and forgiveness, only God can do that. you got storms all around you. Here's the thing about it. You want to be tapped because people will look at you if you're filled with the Spirit and they will have no idea how you're so calm, even joyful in the midst of such tragedy and chaos. It is the Spirit of God who enables us to do what we don't normally do. And so by comparison and contrast to this uh, under the influence of alcohol, being under the influence of the Spirit of God, it leads to control. Secondly of all, it leads to constancy. There's this comparison, right? Because to be drunk with wine is not a permanent state. Nobody gets drunk and is drunk from then on, right? You've got to continually pour the alcohol in your body. You've got to continue to go back to continue the intoxication. The same is with the Spirit. Again, baptism happens once in your life, the moment you trust Christ. The indwelling of the Spirit of God takes place in a moment of time that can never be repeated. But being filled with the Spirit is that that must continue. 
But let me give you just an idea from Scripture how this works. And maybe, maybe there's an old me inside of every one of us. Matthew 16 is one of the most glorious chapters because it's there that Jesus made that phenomenal statement, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And that one chapter, only separated by a few verses, you got Peter who comes up and when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. Jesus says, Peter, you got it right. You got it right and the only reason you know this is my Father in heaven showed it to you. He taught you that. Peter, way to go, you're in tune spiritually. A few verses transpire and Jesus says, I've got to tell you guys some bad news. I'm going to be handed in the hands of sinners and I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise again the third day. And Peter got too much of that clap and he says, oh no, you ain't. He says, Lord, that ain't happening. You are not going down that road. That is not going to take place. And Jesus says to him, remember that? Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't desire the things God desires, he says. In a few moments, imagine how this plays out on a typical day. My mind just kind of pictures it, rolls the movie, and here's Peter. He says the right thing. He's looking at all the apostles, and they're like, yeah, we were going to say that, right? And he's all getting applauded and bragged on by God. The next minute, Peter said, I'm going to get this next one right, too. And he jumps out, puts his foot in his mouth, and Jesus said, now, the first the Father was motivating, and now Satan's motivating this. See how quickly we can go from being spirit-filled to fleshly? In fact, that's why the struggle is Galatians chapter 5, 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that you cannot do the things that you would. It will never be easy whether you're going to try to sin and the spirit of God's going to be dealing with you or you're going to try to do everything right and that flesh is going to constantly be a albatross around your neck. So there's this constancy where it must be going back. It's like the children of Israel, God, 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 they're hungry and they're starving in the wilderness and God rained down that beautiful, wonderful manna from heaven problem was you couldn't just go eat it one day. They had to get up. Remember how God timed that? They had to get up when? Every morning. First thing in the morning, God spread it all on the ground. So guess where their first part of their day was spent? On their knees gathering fresh manna. Why? To live. That's right. That's right. To live. And that it died without it. Here's the problem. God's trying to emphasize that's the church. You can't make it without me. You got the Spirit of God, yes, but now you got to stay filled with, you got to make sure you are taking God seriously and His presence seriously and you're being a good steward of God's investment and make sure every day you're prepared to be in tune with God and walk in the Spirit. Third of all is the comparison of the company. So he says, the reason don't be drunk with wine, he says, wherein is excess. Excess doesn't mean as we use it many times, like it's just more or going to some extent. The word excess is actually a combination word. It starts with the letter A, which means no, and the other word that means saved. So the word excess means unsaved. He says when you walk, as a man walks on the influence of alcohol, he lives in ungodly ways. He lives and talks and thinks and acts in ways that don't belong in a believer's life. Unsaved. It really goes on, not only unsaved, but it goes for to be unwhole, unhealed. In other words, people need that. They're medicating their own souls through alcohol. See, whenever I used to talk to people, of course, alcohol would dominate in my life or as a young man and people that I talk to on a regular basis, same reason. We're always trying to make excuses for why we need it. But here's the thing about it. Every reason you come up with that you need alcohol are all the reasons your God wants to fulfill that. That's right. Amen. God wants to be that to you. God wants to be your, your knock off the edge at the end of the day. God wants to be the one that, that puts you in a good frame. God wants to be the one that eases your stresses and your strains. And all without a hangover, my friend. Amen. And so the excess, he says, listen, that, that leads to that. It's the same word used in Luke 15, 3 when it talks about the prodigal son going and taking all that he had and he wasted it in riotous living, unsaved lifestyle, unwhole, unhealed lifestyle. And so here's what I've learned. You, you know, come up with these old sayings. People that grew up in the 40s and 50s, they come up with all these sayings and they're really biblically based. They just weren't quoting a verse. And so they had many, and, but one of them used to be this way. It says that birds of a feather... They flock together. You know what? I've been observing that my whole life. Pre-Christ, after Christ. See, I know drunks. Drunks like to hang out with other drunks. 
And so you know what? When God saved me, He did. He took me from one group that I used to run with. And listen, all of a sudden, went out with a whole nother group, a group I'd have never had any business with. See, there's something about that it, it draws you to that. And you, you began to, even as Romans 8, you began to have this testimony and bear witness, right, of one of it and other. That when you're around another believer, you're like, hey, we share the same daddy. We share the same eternal home. We share the same access in prayer. We share the same privilege of having the presence of God on the inside. My friend, here's what God's calling us to do. He says, I want you to be filled with the Spirit. That's a constant command over our life. What I would tell you this on a personal basis is this, my friend. We don't need educated teachers in this church. We need Spirit-filled teachers in this church. We just don't need excellent, skilled singers in this church. In fact, I'd rather do without them unless they're Spirit-filled singers in this church. We, we don't need leaders who just have experience and ability. No, we need spirit-filled leaders. Here's what I found many times. The spirit-filled far, far overcompensates than any skill a man has ever possessed in his life. Amen. We need people in touch with God, empowered by God for the glory of God. That is spirit-filling. The second note I want to point out is not only what is being filled with the spirit, which in simply just means to be controlled by him, Second of all are the consequences of living under the influence. He told you what the, what the consequences of living under the influence of alcohol, that leads to debauchery. That, that'll make you waste a lot of life. That'll make, you, that'll make you make decision in your life. You will long in time and eternity regret. Amen. But he says when you're filled with the Spirit, let me tell you, show you what that looks like. We, we can read these verses and it's almost as if we're saying, okay, when you're filled with the Spirit, it will lead to these things. And when you, when, when you do these things, it, it invites this continual connection with the Spirit. The consequences are simple. There are three. First of all, he says in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when you feel with the Spirit of God, one of the things we're going to see is it leads to a singing spirit and a singing voice. If you hear Wednesday night, I preached on Psalm 71, the, the, the prayer of an old man. And here he's talking about God, let my lips sing to you and my soul. God, don't let me go through the motions. I wonder if we got a, if we got a, a, a report card this morning, how many were were. were uttering the words, how many were just kind of mouthing the words, and how many were engaged with the words as you sang to God. He says, I want both. He says, a singing spirit. He goes on, see, God loves singing. Y'all realize God loves singing? I had a preacher tell me one time, I just don't want, I, I want to get rid of the singing. I don't want all the singing in the church. I just want to get up and preach. I said, the moment you get rid of singing, my friends, the time you give up what God loves. He loves to hear his children sing. By the way, you, you read in passages like Zephaniah 3, 17, where God does some singing himself. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse 12, Matthew 20, verse number 30. You, you find the Lord Jesus saying, I'm singing right there among my brethren. I'm telling you what, I don't care. That's why I sit up. I'm kind of a groupie, right? I don't just sit up up front because I'm the pastor. I like to sit up close to the choir where I can hear them and I can sing out and y'all don't have to hear me sing. <laughs> I do wonder sometimes if I slip to the back, if it discourages my worship because some of y'all are muttering instead of singing to God. I'll tell you another thing. Read quite often the Psalms. God says, do it loudly. He likes his music loud. And guess what? I guarantee you, you got that one song you like to crank up on the radio too. You just don't like it when the young people want to do it. So God loves singing. Now, he says through, we're, we're, we're to be filled with the Spirit, and then he goes straight into, this is part of the sentence, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Notice he lists that, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Now every now and then you'll come across some guy that'll try to define what these mean. I'm telling you what, I've been reading for 30 years, studying these guys, trying to, and, and ain't nobody got it. Psalms, yes, it's directly related to the 150 of the Old Testament, right? You got hymns. Early church sang psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. People can try to define those however they want to. They can't, they, there's no, they're going to make mud of it. All you got to realize when he says psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart, there's two things you can take away. One is variety. He didn't say just sing psalms. He didn't say just sing hymns. You know how many people are in bondage to, to any growth or enjoyment of Christianity because they think if you don't have church and you don't have hymns and you ain't have worship, my friend, I feel so sorry for people. 
that your soul is so little and your mind is so small that you've, you've shrunk your Christianity into something so small. Now, I want to tell you what, and then spiritual songs. And so there's a variety there. The reality is uh, it don't matter that you have to like every single tune and every single song. It means that you come into a body of family where there's some variety and you're willing to whatever's going on, my friend, you find some way to worship. I've heard preachers that can't preach and somewhere along the line, if they'll just say Jesus every now and then, I'm telling you what, I'm ready to stay right with them. People bore you dead. I mean, we used to have Ain't Ethel stand up and want to sing some old song. And you're like, please don't. Please, please, please. Because this ain't going to be singing. This is more like the morning rooster going off. But I tell you what, stand and give me the words. Let me hear the words about Jesus. Sing me a song about Jesus and I'll find something to rejoice in. My friend, that's the worship in Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. And I'm going to tell you what, you cannot be filled with the Spirit while you're grumbling over every kind of song and music. That be mutually together. He says, now sing. Sing in Psalms. So it speaks of variety. Uh, here's the, I love this in Revelation chapter uh, 17, I believe it is. Revelation 17, you, you start reading about what's happening there. No, chapter 15. And the Bible says in one verse, verse number 3, it says, And they sang the song of Moses. And the song of the Lamb. Guess what? you got the New Testament church reaching back, singing all the way back to the song of Moses, whether that's Exodus 15 exactly or not. But they're singing some Old Testament song. And all of a sudden now the Old Testament, they're singing this song of the Lamb. And the glory, glory of heaven is, they ain't particular. They ain't worried why. There's Jesus right there. I'm satisfied in Him. I, I, I know God's going to have to sanctify the music or He's going to have to sanctify my ears when we get to heaven because I'm not pleased with every kind of Christian music. But there I will be. And I'm going to try my best. Listen, if they're bragging on Jesus, I'm going to I'm, I'm try to listen and enjoy worshiping God in the Spirit. The second thing that phrase speaks of is not only the variety, but it speaks of musical instruments. It's amazing to me how off so many religions, particularly the Church of Christ, they, they want to take the music, which is so funny and it's so really hypocritical because they don't want music in the church, but they'll listen to music in their car. <laughs> and and the, the Christian song, they'll sing some of the same songs which are not written a cappella, so they got to go listen to them with music and then sing a cappella. We're so weird. People are weird. But every one of these words, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, they're all connected to instruments. When he says singing, making melody in your heart, it literally means to strum an instrument. And so everything that is descriptive here describes variety. It describes uh, instruments. And so all these go together. So he says, and we ought to sing, watch that verse, uh, verse number 19, singing, making melody where? In your heart. That means he says singing to each other. Now that's publicly and also singing where? In your heart. Singing to God, not just about God. And so the reality is we come singing from the heart. Some have asked the question, so which is the cause and which is the effect? Is it when we are filled with the Spirit of God that we will sing and keep this melody in our heart all through the day? Or is it by the practice of singing and keeping melody in our heart that we actually stay in tune and filled with the Spirit? The reality is, my friend, that's trying to, for me, wonder what goes into a, an apple cobbler. I don't care. I just want some. So the reality, if you're not feeling very filled, sing a song, my friend, and it'll invite the Spirit of God to control your life. And that is not just when everything's up. See, this is when the Spirit of God fills your life and controls you against the norms. Remember Apostle Paul and, and Silas, Acts 16, they've just been beaten. They're put within an inner prison in a dungeon. And there at midnight, when everybody else is sleeping, including the guard, all of a sudden you start hearing Paul go, Mmm. And Silas says, do that again. Mm -hmm. And they break out into a song. And they begin to sing praise to God. You say, that is so absurd. How can men with bloody backs sing a song to God? Because they were filled, controlled, influenced by the Spirit of God. And by the way, that one moment won one of the first converts to Philippi and started the church all throughout the city. So singing, he says. Just a note, by the way. When you're not walking in the Spirit of God, usually your song is the first thing to go. When, you, when, when you're walking with God, your song many times is the first thing to go. The second indicator of spiritual fulfilledness is not only singing, but serenity. See, he says in verse number 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many of y'all sometimes are reading your Bibles and you read that and you say, uh, yeah, but... Sounds good? Yeah, but. 
That's, 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 that's too top shelf for me. I can't reach that. Be thankful. Give thanks always for how many things? All things. Serenity. Who can do that? Spirit-filled people can. Spirit-filled people, because in all things, he's obviously including all the up days as well as the down days. All, all the stories of, of success as well as the stories and times of failure. The times of gain and the times of loss. In the midst of that, he says, this, I want you to give thanks to God always for all things. Why? Why, God, would you want me to give, be thankful that I lost my job? Why, God, would you want me to be thankful if my health has been challenged? Why would I give thanks for this? Because as Romans 8 says, all these things are working for you. They're working together for your good, for the glory of Almighty God. And so He teaches us to be, to be thankful while we're walking the Spirit. That means thankful for blessings, stuff you got, stuff you don't got. Amen? There's sometimes it's the stuff I don't have I can be more grateful for the stuff I do have. Amen? And then he says, be thankful before the battle. Don't, don't just always rejoice once it's won. The, the, the honor and the privilege and the power of the Spirit of God, He'll let you go ahead and be thankful long before you ever see the execution of God's answer in your life. Be, be, be prayer. Israel rejoiced before they went to battle. And then we'd be rejoicing in the times of most difficulty. You know, we note uh, Daniel... In chapter 6, when he was carried, uh, be, being set up and, and, and known he was going to be thrown in the lion's den if he, if he had any dealings with any other gods. And we know three day, times a day, like he always did, he opened the window, right? He opened the window toward Jerusalem and he prayed three times, got on his knees and prayed three times a day. There's a phrase in that that does sometimes get missed. In Daniel chapter number 6, uh, in verse number 10, it says, He prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a time. You know what it means? Daniel was thankful when he was the prince under the king with all this influence and all this power. And the moment he knew his life was on the line, he would be in the lines. Then by the next day, he still gave thanks. Who does that? Spirit-filled people. By the way, unthankfulness is the mark of lostness. When you're ungrateful... And you're and you're you're not thankful. That's Romans chapter one verse twenty one says that's the first step away from God. Spirit of God loves to bless. He loves to strength. He loves to heal. And my friend, here's what he likes. He likes some thank yous. He likes some thank yous. He don't need anything for you. All he wants you to do is bless him, recognizing that without me you can do nothing, and by me you can do anything I empower you to do. And just let me know, thank you. And Romans one twenty one is the first step away from spirit-filledness and the presence of God. But the third mark, and interesting, we'll be talking about this in the rest of the book, and that is the mark of submission. Verse 21 is connected with these verses. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You could almost put a semicolon at the end of that verse because everything he's going to talk about through the rest of the book is about how Christians are to submit. How we submit to each other in, in yielding to one another, in charity and kindness, and not always having to have our way and press our way. Then He'll give us all those positions that, that we're to exercise submission, whether to God at all times, and then the individuals who have God-given authority in our life. And by the way, He says, when you're following the Spirit of God, which Jesus says would always be pointing us to Himself, you never look more like Jesus than when you're yielding and when you're giving and when you're submitting. And my friend, you never look more like the devil of hell himself when we fail to submit. You say, well, I don't, I don't want to submit. You don't know my husband. I, I don't want to submit. You don't know my boss. I don't want to submit. You don't know my parents. I don't want to submit. You don't know our government. He said, don't matter. What I'm calling you to do is spirit-filled. And when you're under the influence of the Spirit of God, He will cause you to do things you would not normally do. And so you submit not by your own attitude or because you come up with willpower. You submit because God Almighty has called you to and He is the one who will empower you to do it and will be the recipient of blessings. In fact, the very word to submit, it has two aspects. One military, one non-military. The military aspect of submission, it means to arrange troops under fashion under, under a commander. So it literally means in actions, you, you listen and follow who have authority in your life. It also goes to a non-military word which speaks to our attitude. So it's not just the actions of submission God's looking for, it's the attitude of submission. It means a voluntary attitude of giving in, of cooperation, of assuming responsibility. 
And my friend, when we submit, remember this, Jesus submitted himself to the Father, which caused him to submit himself to sinful hands, which caused himself to submit himself to a cross. And the results were salvation bought for every person who will trust him. And so there's no greater way we can reflect Jesus as a spirit-filled human being than when we're doing this. We're humble, we pursue unity, and we pursue a, a yieldedness of care and concern. As Philippians tells us, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of the other. That is Christ in a human body by the Spirit. And so these are the three characteristics. Are you filled with the Spirit of God? Here's what it looked like. My friend, you've got a song on your heart every day, all day. That's what he's saying. You're doing these things perpetually. You've you got a thankful spirit. You're not worried about what you ain't getting. You're worried about, hey, God's been so good to me. And that produces an incredible humility to realize how truly blessed I am no matter what my circumstances are. And a submissive spirit, not pride, not arrogance, but a submissive spirit is the marks of a spirit-filled person. I'm going to close with these practical steps. I'm going to run through them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but sometimes people have the question. They say, okay, if being filled with the Spirit is this command of God and, and, and it produces, it, it looks like these. These are the things, but I don't see these things predominant in my life. How, what steps can I take biblically to make sure I am I'm filled with the Spirit? Let me give you five things. One, a consciousness of God's presence. Everything he writes in here is always as unto the Lord, to the Lord, in the fear of God. It means this, when we walk and live to be spirit-filled, what would come by being conscious of God's presence. Remember when 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, pray without what? Ceasing. What does that mean? It means you're always in an attitude of acknowledging God's presence. He's always there. You don't have to come to church. You don't have to get in an altar to talk to God. You talk with Him through the day. You continually keep this ongoing relationship. As I believe His name was... Um, uh, Anyway, famous uh, uh, pastor, minister wrote a little book. In fact, I think he was a layman. Wrote a little book called Practicing the Presence of God. Practicing the Presence of God. And that means everywhere you go, you just realize God's there. You're conscious of it. You think that would make a difference in your life if you were always conscious that God is there too? Let me ask you this. Would it change your, your life at all, your practices, if the preacher was always there? He's always in your living room? Or if he's always with you at work, he's always riding with you in traffic. If the preacher was there, what if your mama was with you all the time? Would, you, would that change how you act or talk or dress or go? Would that change anything? So, so the, very, the very fact that we know certain people's presence would change the way we talk and we act, a consciousness that God, our body, is his temple. We are in, we, we are in relationship with him. He's always there and being conscious of that. Secondly of all, it's the confidence of his presence. Confidence. When chapter 5, verse number 20 says we to go and we give thanks and all these things, it's confidence because we're going and we're saying, God, I can't do this. My flesh is weak. All that Paul did, we look at the marvel of Paul and what he did and so forth. And in Philippians 3, let me make sure you understand this on no uncertain terms. We do not put confidence in our flesh. Amen. Old Testament taught the arm of flesh will fail you. Trust you, you lose. Trust you, you'll lack. And so he says our confidence is in God. It's, it's kind of like a set of gloves. That's really all we are, my friend, is just a set of gloves. Usually I try to keep them all around because you go losing. They may, I come up missing gloves all the time. I don't know if that's kids or what. So I, I carry some in my car, in the, in the house, in the garage, one, one in each of the vehicles I drive. You never know. But I'll tell you, all those gloves do is lay there all day, every day, until, my friend, I stick a hand in it. And that's all we are. We are nothing. We are worthless. We are helpless. We're gloves laying around until Almighty God, we recognize, God, I need the hand. I need the unseen hand of God empowering, directing, feeling, and making my life matter and count. Confidence in His presence. Thirdly of all, confession uh, in His presence. This excess, he said, when he says, don't be drunk with wine that leads to these things, as he's taught us already in this chapter, th these things grieve the Spirit of God. They quench the Spirit of God. I want to be filled. I don't want to be quenching Him or grieving Him. I want to be full of Him. And sometimes, my friend, the way you get there, the quickest way to Spirit filling is to some spiritual confession. Amen. Amen. They got Drano for plumbing, clean out the, all the clogs, and we got confession. 
The stuff that blocks us from the flow of the filling of God's Spirit is sometimes just a, a kneel away where you don't have to go see a guy with his collar turned around backward. No, friend, you call on the Father in the name of Jesus. And my friend, He's ready to hear and forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Cooperation number four. Again, through the rest of the book, you'll find how he's saying, do it this way. Be a child this way. Be a parent this way. Be a husband. Be a wife. He's going to call us in all these things. And he's saying, you just cooperate with me. Uh, honey, love your, uh, respect your husband as unto the Lord. Love your wives as Christ loved. Children obey. This is right in the Lord. Everything had to do with, I'm going to work. Don't serve them because they're a man. You work for Jesus. Serve Him. Work for him, them as you work for Him. Ultimately, all our, all our accountability is in cooperating with God. One of the greatest words used in the Scripture that teaches us is, is the word yielding. Romans 6, the great passages, teaches three things that the church should know. We should know what we're supposed to do, reckon the righteousness of Christ in us, and then yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. Yield ourselves to Him. And then fifthly of all, consumption. Read with me real quick. I want to have you turn one and we're done. Read it with me so it's in our mind. Verse 18 and 19, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now that's the book of Ephesians. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter number 3, and I'm going to end with this verse. You just go right, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I told you, and I've said it before, Ephesians and Colossians are written very much parallel. They cover the same material, Almost in, in, in sometimes very much in the same terminology. And here we find Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. Remember what we read in Ephesians. Be filled with the Spirit and singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Those sound familiar? So in Ephesians, he says, be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, on the same instance, they be filled with the Word. What do these have to do with each other? Well, we're going to learn that through the book of Ephesians because the Spirit wrote a book, and it's called the Holy Bible. I remember a young man telling me one day, he didn't want to read the Bible. He said he'd read it before. He wanted, but he, but he, he's all, all this spiritual talk, and he says, sometimes you Baptists just think we're supposed to have a relationship with a book. That's what he said. Well, my friend, the difference in this book and any other book is what Jesus said in John 6. My words, they are life and they're spirit. Or as Hebrews says, the Word of God is alive. This is His book. He's called in chapter number 6, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God. And so how do, I, how do I stay filled with the Spirit? My friend, you, you, you recount the words He pinned down to have and put in your mind and in your heart. The more you consume, like the children of Israel gathering their manna, we gather the Word of God and we pour it in our soul and the Spirit of God uses the book He wrote to invest and teach and guide and nourish us by His truth. Remember being in a service? Probably only happened ten, two times in about 30 years of ministry. It's radical. That's why it stands out so much. But both of them happened in prison, never happened in a church. Maybe it'll happen sometime in church. Never happened in a church. But two times in the, in the prison, I've had guys and they come up. My boys were part of one of them and have had guys speak up and they'll come up and they'll say, Hey, we got music back in our, in our dorms. We got, we got our music back in our cells. Can, can we just move past the singing and get into the Word? I ain't ever heard a Baptist say that. Most Baptists ain't got the appetite for it. And I'll tell you what, my friend, consumption, when you realize to be spirit-filled is not being in some kind of crazy, ecstatic state that you get into because people are mumbling over you or you're mumbling. That is not spirit-filled. Spirit-filled is when the Word of God, you get in it and it gets in you and controls your behavior and your attitude and your actions. And the reality is, if all the feeding you get is on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or a Sunday night, I'm just telling you, it ain't enough. It ain't enough. you got to pick up a spoon and fork for yourself and learn to stay in the Word of God for it continue to make sure you're filled at all times every day. 
You've heard the warnings. I've heard the warnings not to feed the bears in Yellowstones and in other parks. And I, I used to think, well, maybe there's stuff in the food. And I read an article one time that says, no, it's not the food that kills the bears. It's the fact when people start feeding the bears and they get used to that food, they lose either they lose the desire or the skill to go hunt their own food and they die of starvation. And my friend, you got a book written by the Holy Spirit of God and He wrote it to you. And when you feast off His Word, He nourishes your life. I don't know about you when I hear a challenging message or I read a text that sets a bar so lofty and I feel so small and inadequate. I realize and I have to come to realize this is this is why the, the New Testament is the New Testament. The Old Testament commands, directions, all. But the New Testament comes with the power of God. It's called the New Covenant. It's not only new, my friend. Paul says it's better. Why is it better? Well, I ask you. You want Ten Commandments for your life? It just says, hey, here's the good points of life. Do this and you'll be all right. You ever try to keep all those tens? Pretty, pretty, pretty difficult. It'll make a failure out of you. And all of a sudden, now God comes and says, Hey, don't you keep these Ten Commandments, but don't just keep them. I'm going to come inside you. And I'm going to carve them on your, on your heart. And I'm going to change your life. And I'm going to give you a competing nature with the man you're born. I'm going to put my presence on the inside of you, and He's going to empower you for life. I don't know which side of the cross you'd rather be on. I'm safe and sound on this side. Amen. I'm so grateful God didn't just give me religion. I'm telling you, through our whole family. I don't know how it works in your family. I'm not satisfied just to see somebody say, okay, I'm going to church now. I'm not satisfied to that. I've seen too many people go to church their, their whole life, and there's many, even according to Scripture, that are probably in hell today because they were good church members. I don't want my family to be good church members. I want them to be born-again Christians. I don't have the Spirit of God on the inside. I want them to get the motor and the power of God that radically changes the life. It doesn't kind of reorder any behavior. It changes the heart. Amen. And that's what God offers. So here's the reality, church. The invitation is this. If you don't know Christ today, you say, oh, I, I want the Spirit of God in my life. I, I want Him empowering my life. Well, my friend, it's not about you coming and asking God to fill you with the Spirit. That's not what you need. All you need to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And the moment you do that, God does a miracle for you. He baptizes you into His body, the church, and His family. And He puts within you His Holy Spirit. That, my friend, you have no part you trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. And the moment you do that, God does those things for you. For every person who's placed your faith in Christ and know Jesus as your Lord, the command of God is this, be filled with the Spirit. You walk cooperatively. Be yielded to Him. Be controlled by Him. That, my friend, He puts in our lap to make sure that I am being a good steward of what God has put in my life, His own presence. Let's bow for prayer today. Would you stand with me all over the building? Spirit of God's here. What will you do with Him today? Ma'am, sir, young person, Spirit of God's here. Beyond anything this flailing, fallible preacher has uttered today, what is the Spirit of God speaking to you through His Word? He wants to convince you he wants to convince you that without Him, you're nothing. Without salvation, my friend, you have no life. You have no future. Holy Spirit of God wants to point you to a cross where the Savior's bleeding and He's dying and going through all the wrath of God just to spare you and make you His own. That's what the Spirit of God's doing in this room. If you don't know Christ today, He's calling you to trust Him. Will you do that today? My friend, God does the miracle. All we do is the trusting. Will you believe right now Jesus died on the cross? Will you believe right now He did that for love and sacrifice on your behalf? Will you right now believe Jesus rose again the third day? And will you believe that He's the living Lord and receive Him into your life to change you, to make you His follower, His son? Will you receive Him today? 
Are you willing to painfully turn away from your own self and crown Jesus Lord of your life today by faith? If you'll trust Him right now, He'll save you. Do the miracle only God can do. Will you trust Him right now? Will you trust Him? My friend, you may be a born-again believer with Holy Spirit power. A power plant that rests in your life. Outlets that can be connected all over. And my friend, you face all your present struggles on your own. And you feel depleted and you feel helpless. And you're confused. You're ready to give up. You're exhausted. If this morning by faith, if the Bible is the truth of God's Word and, and you trusted Christ, the Spirit lives in you. Believe that. If you'll trust His Word, read His Word, He will guide you in every right step. Believe that. He's in you for good, never to leave you, nor to forsake you. Believe that. He's commanding you to let Him control your life so He will. Believe that. One of your greatest strengths before you leave this building this morning may be just the fact that you as a believer came exhausted before God and said, Lord, I can't, but I know you can, and I'm going to trust you to do that. I may not feel love. I might even feel forgiveness. I, I may not feel uh, joy. I may not feel commitment. But Almighty God, I'm going to trust Your presence in my life. Give me the one thing I lack the most. Give me Your power. Some of you need to turn away from sin and compromise and perversions in your own life. You say, how can I break this? You do it by trusting the Spirit of God. Let Him control your life. Some of you got loved ones that are dying and you know they don't know Christ. You need to open your mouth, put everything at risk, share the gospel. Preach, I don't know how to do that. You do it by the power of the Spirit of God.